It is now time to broach what is kind of the elephant in the room here. There's a lot of dudes in food. Um, and in some areas of the food business, women are really, really, really rare. So what's a girl to do? The women on this next panel called Broads in a Bros World, they have a few ideas. Uh, first up is Jen Christie. Jen is an influential marketing professional with a decade of experience in social media, digital, and channel marketing at John Deere. In 2013, she established the Ag Women's Network with a team of passionate, like-minded women. And with her leadership, AWN has grown to nearly 2,000 women. A proud alumnus of the 4-H, Jen is now the Director of Business Development for 4-H Canada. She has an MBA from the Ivy School of Business and loves to travel, eat, and spend time with her family on their sixth generation generation dairy and grain, and grain farm in Bruce County. <laughs> Second is Momoji Kishi. Momoji or Momi as she likes to be called was born and raised in Nagano, Japan. She grew up working in her parents bed and breakfast and was a competitive skier before moving to Toronto in, in 2001. Momi has been a foodie all her life, but it wasn't until she discovered the third wave coffee movement in 2005 that her life changed. Momi was the first ever employee at Toronto's legendary Dark Horse Espresso Coffee Shop, where for five years, I know it's one of my local coffee shops, where for five years as barista and manager, she experimented with different coffee beans, roasts, equipment, and preparations. True to her competitive nature, she started competing as a barista, winning the Eastern Canada and Central Canada competition in 2009 and 2011. She moved from Dark Horse to work at Detour Roasters in Dundas, Ontario, and Nadege before opening her own coffee shop, Hot Black Coffee, at Queen and University in 2016. Also on our panel is Ivy Knight. Ivy cooked professionally for 10 years before becoming a writer. She's written for Chatelaine, Playboy, and is a regular contributor to Vice. She is currently at work on her fourth book. Welcome, Ivy. <laughs> Finally, we have Crystal Luxmore. Crystal is a certified, how do you Cicerone, a certified Cicerone professional beer and cider judge and a seasoned journalist. Together with her sister Tara, she runs the Beer Sisters, where the duo lead tutored tasting and create stellar events for corporate clients and major festivals in Canada and the US. Crystal writes about libations for the Globe and Mail, Toronto Life, LCBO's Food and Drink, Beer Advocate, and MASH magazines. She's appeared as a beer expert on CTV, Global TV, CBC Radio, and on Good Morning Texas. Crystal says, there is nothing she likes more than talking about beer except drinking it. A girl after my own heart. Please welcome Crystal. And the panel is being moderated by the very lovely Katie Underwood, senior editor at Chatelaine. Um, this event is also being live streamed on Facebook and we'll take some questions from viewers a little later on. Katie, take it away. All right. Uh, well, I really can't think of a better time to talk about sexism than after a beer break. Um, <laughs> One of the lazier questions that I tried to avoid as a journalist is asking women what it's like to be a female anything when I'm interviewing them, but I've actually conveniently found myself hosting the panel where it's actually an appropriate question. Um, so all of you are you know, working in industries that are sort of food adjacent, and Ivy, you've spent time in the food industry as a cook, now you're a journalist, Crystal, you're in beer, Jen, you're in agriculture, and Momi, you're in coffee. Um, all of which are fairly male-dominated industries. And so I did want to ask the dreaded question, um, how do you think being a woman has affected your career trajectory? Um, has it at all? I'll start with you. Well, um, I first of all would say that isn't every career male-dominated? <laughs> Vanna White's doing well in yarn, but aside from that, I think... <laughs> Men dominate every field. So I think it's just, um, you know, just having a career at all as a woman has, it comes with its own set of challenges. You've actually written, um, this guy is molesting me. <laughs> Dude. You couldn't wait like five minutes. <laughs> um, Ivy, I was wondering if you could expand on that just because you've been so open about your experiences of, of harassment when you were working in kitchens, and why did you feel compelled to sort of share those stories on the record? 
Um, I felt compared to share them because I think it's like the only way that you can get over it. Um, where I was choked by my sous chef was in the kitchen of this building actually because the restaurant used to be in this building. So it's cool to be here now in a different context. <laughs> um, yeah, so I wrote about it because I was able to, first of all, because I had the venue and the, my editor advice was interested in the story and because um, it's, I just think getting, just talking about it as we've all been talking about things like this in the last few weeks, more, na more so now than ever. Uh, has, is, it's just, it just helps a lot. It helps you feel like, it helps you exorcise the demon. It helps you to feel like you're not alone. And it also helps you get back some of the strength and the power that was taken away by the fucker who threw you down and choked you in front of a whole team and nobody did anything about it. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, it doesn't hurt as much. Yeah. There must be some catharsis in that, obviously. Yeah, good word. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> um, Crystal, you, when you and I were talking before this panel, you mentioned that there were actually some, you know, uh, unlikely upsides to being kind of the, the lone wolf woman in your industry. Did you want to sort of explain? Yeah, well, first of all, obviously, I'm not the lone wolf in beer. There are many talented women in beer, many of whom are here today, the Society of Beer Drinking Ladies founders over there, and my sister. Um, but uh, for me personally, because I'm a journalist, I never worked in a brewery. Um, I've never been on kind of the front lines at a festival. I've never bartended. So having come at beer as a writer, uh, I haven't faced a lot of overt sexism because brewers want me to write nice things about them. So they're not going to joke me or uh, do any of those things. And I think that craft beer as a whole tends to be quite a friendly uh, industry, um, not to say that sexism doesn't exist, but for me as a writer, it's been really positive because everyone remembers who I am really quickly. Uh, I think it helped me get noticed, um, and people were just very friendly, and, and they didn't really, you know, talk down to me or belittle my knowledge. Uh, um, so I didn't, I haven't really faced that much sexism, and I have had a, lot, a really good experience mm -hmm. as a woman in the beer industry. Jen, how about you being in agriculture? A couple things. The my my career itself. Um, I I'd echo Crystal's comments. I I think being a woman in a company that didn't have a lot of women uh, in leadership roles and in even our team in Canada when I when I started at John Deere, uh, you do you do get remembered. And I think like every industry, I don't think agriculture is different. You have to work that much harder and you have to advocate that much more for yourself. Uh, in, in agriculture and within those, those organizations to, to get ahead and, and show that you deserve to be there. Uh, I think we've come a long way and uh, women are, are pretty respected in the industry, but you don't typically think of a woman when you think about a farmer, right? So there are certainly, uh, there certainly is still sexism that, that happens and exists. And I think over the course of the last couple of weeks and everything that's been going on, has forced me to also reflect a little bit and think about uh, the choices that I've made over my career. And I think I've been very uh, lucky within, within my former employer to not run into a lot of that, but I can, uh, I can say with confidence that um, there's sectors of our industry where that, that may be more prominent and, and I, I think I made some choices uh, to avoid that in, in some instances. Mm -hmm. so, uh, so it, it does. It does still exist, and we have to we have to you know, work to make sure that the women that are going into the industry uh, are aware, and that we're trying to do a better job mm -hmm. and get the men around us to do a better job to to make this a more inclusive industry for mm -hmm. women. And Momi, there you are. Yes. Uh, <laughs> Does so that ring true of the coffee world too? Um, no, I didn't really feel like uh, we were male dominated and until like I was. Told and I saw one day like one competition like everybody else beside me was a man and it's like oh this is uh, male dominated, but um, I had a very lucky situation like I was working at the uh, Dark Horse and Nadej and uh, they both have the women as a owner they are here today and they taught us like taught me 
by action, like, you know, I had a mentor right there, and they equally treated everybody, so I never re really felt like we were, I was in male-dominated until, like, somebody said, like, oh, you're the only woman. Because mm -hmm. I, I did have a great example over here, and, yeah, I was really lucky. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That actually nicely leads into my, my next uh, topic, which is about mentorship. And, you know, as we've seen from sort of unfortunately uh, newsworthy, unfortunate newsworthy story, stories over the past little while, so much of the information that women get about how to navigate their jobs um, in light of, you know, if there are men who are predatory in their working environment or, you know, in positions of leadership, that news sort of comes to them via back channels from other women. Um, they say things like, you know, maybe don't work in the kitchen with Chef X, or, you know, there's always kind of this, like, clandestine whispering. And I'm wondering, you know, maybe in not such extreme situations, who were the women who helped you along the way, and what did they say to you? That's, that's your... Me? Yeah. Um, well, I've had quite a few people who've helped me along the way. Mostly in kitchens, it's all been men, because I've worked with so many men. Um, and there have been a lot of great male mentors. Mm -hmm. Um, but I have had the women who've been great mentors usually have come from front of house because when you work in back of house, for those of you who do, you'll understand me, and for those of you who don't, um, when you work in back of house, you sort of don't learn any social graces. So you're kind of like, you know, this crazy maniac who swears a lot and doesn't really understand how to, how to exist in, the poli in polite society. So women, <laughs> so some of my mentors uh, come from... Uh, from marketing. Um, the head of marketing at the Drake Hotel, Rachel Yeager, has been a really great mentor. Um, just in helping me to negotiate for myself or to have these conversations that women need to have around um, employment and pay and things like that. In kitchens, you don't, you're not supposed to talk about pay or ask for money. You're doing it for some you know, ethereal passion or whatever. So Rachel's been a great mentor. Also Jasmine Baker, who runs For the Love of Food. She does a lot of the food programming at different music festivals like Way Home and Field Trip. And she's also been a really great mentor. And we act like men and go to steakhouses and have meetings <laughs> at steakhouses and talk about how to topple the patriarchy. And it's really great. So I'm really grateful to those, those two chicks. Yeah. Uh, Jen, I wanted to ask about um, the women in your family because you grew up on a grain and dairy farm in Bruce County and you said that, you know, there was a fairly equitable division of responsibility. Was that sort of formative for you and, and seeing that as, you know, different from the rest of the farming world? Uh, definitely for me. Um, so my, my, both my parents are farmers. Uh, my mom has farms, farmed alongside my dad for the uh, 37 years that they've been married uh, and farming together. And so that, that was her job. So to me, a farmer was my mom, a farmer was my dad. And I think when you grow up in a household like that, uh, and many, in many farm families, that's the case. Uh, you, you my, I'll just say my mom, I, she's probably watching today. Um, she doesn't take shit from no one. And so, <laughs> uh, you know, when, when a salesman comes to the door or calls, and this happens all the time, it happens all the time still to many, many uh, farm women, uh, you know, when they want to speak to the boss of the house and they ask to speak to my dad, that's not, that's not an appropriate question. So, I mean, in some ways it's a positive because if you don't want to do business with them, it's a very easy way to keep the door closed. Um, but uh, but that, that, was, that was the role model for me in my life, right? And that you, basically, you do what you want to do and you go after it and these gendered roles didn't, uh, didn't really exist in our household. And, and I just want to say, because I think this is really cool, um, our family farm was actually passed down through the women. So it was my great grandma's uh, on my, my dad's mom's side uh, that settled, it was her ancestors that settled the farm and then it got passed down through my great grandma to my grandma who farmed it um, and then my dad and, and my mom and, and now my brothers. So mm -hmm. it, it very much that um, the, the women in our, in our farm family have been very much engaged and involved. Mm -hmm. um, 
there's not a lot of good news coming out about gender relations lately, I feel, but I wanted to just point out one, one recent news story um, out of New Orleans, and there's um, a fairly notable chef named John Besh. Some of you may be familiar with him. Um, there were 25 women who came forward with accusations of harassment against his restaurant group and himself as well, um, and Jen Egg, who you probably, a lot of you also know, um, a very... A prominent chef in Canada and elsewhere. Um, she wrote about this in the New Yorker and she called her article a Harvey Weinstein moment for the food industry, question mark. Um, and you know, she's saying that some people say that this is the end of institutionalized sexism or meathead culture in the restaurant business. Um, Crystal, I wanted, I wanted to ask you, even though you're, you work in the beverage world, do you buy that this is sort of a tipping point for women in food and drink? Um, do you think that we're actually at a point where um, measurable change is going to happen? Uh, not for women in drink, unfortunately. I mean, um, I was just talking to some of my colleagues in craft beer who work at breweries, and um, and they face sexism all the time, especially like when, when your job is to walk into a bar and sell beer, and uh, you're representing a brewery, and you've got to hit you know 20 bars plus talk to the LCBO. Chances are 99% of the people you encounter are, are men, and not all of them are looking at you like they would look at a male sales rep. They don't take you as seriously. Um, you probably face harassment. You get flirted with all the time. I don't see that this um, restaurateur is going to make a difference. It's also something that isn't really talked about. Um, craft beer is really having a moment right now, a really positive moment, and craft brewers are very self-celebratory about how they're not big beer and they're local and they're reaching out to their communities and doing all these great things and things like sexism kind of gets overlooked. It's something that no one has time to address. It's not something that the Ontario craft brewers are addressing. It's not really anything people talk about. It's just kind of the same issue with drinking and driving when you're a beer rep. There's a lot of things that we need to talk about as an industry that's on a major growth path, just like craft distilling and small wineries. If, you know, if you're running a very small business and you have so much to do, then like, gender equality is the last thing on your list, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. Ivy, because you interact as a food writer with so many you know, kitchen professionals, do you feel like the conversations in kitchens have changed being that we're in present day, or do they feel kind of similar to the way it was a decade ago? Oh, I don't know. I'm not in kitchens anymore. Um, I think that I've been out of kitchens for a while. I've been writing from the safety of my own home for a while. Yeah. But I don't think, like to your question earlier, do you think the John Besh scandal is going to change things? Um, the only way that I think any change will ever come about is if it affects the bottom line, if it affects a restaurant's bottom line. And I think that what John Besh did is going to definitely affect the bottom line of his, his empire. And whoever's, been, whoever's expecting to make money from those restaurants, when they see a dip in profits, then maybe they'll, you know, they got a, they didn't have hu a human resources department in that restaurant empire that had 1,200 staff. Now they do. Mm -hmm. So I think if it affects your bottom line, then maybe it won't be something that you just let slide anymore. Maybe it'll be something that you take seriously. Um, and then also, when this kind of a backlash happens, it makes it harder for media to pr promote and write about events that only um, represent one gender. Mm -hmm. Like uh, my policy for the last few years has been if I'm invited to a food event and only male chefs are cooking, then I, I decline and say that I don't go to events that only represent one gender. And that hasn't resulted in much change. <laughs> but I got, I, got a, I got a text during the last panel from somebody asking me to come to an event, and he told me the lineup. And it's free, and you're totally welcome. It's going to be so fun. And I said, no offense, but I don't attend or cover food events that only showcase one gender. And he said, I actually thought you would bring that up. I still wanted to ask you because it's going to be a great dinner, and no offense, we should definitely be representing all genders in this industry. And I just wrote back, so then why don't you? <laughs> so. Did you reply with any emojis to that, or? <laughs> no, no response. I can think of a few. No response. 
but um, I, so I think that you get, you force change when you affect, if you say I'm not coming to your restaurant because I know that your chef does these things, or if you um, refuse to go to events that only have men as the headliners, or if you, pro you promote and share articles uh, that celebrate events that have a more diverse lineup, then those are some things that you can do. Mm -hmm. And I'll step down off my soapbox now. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay. We're up here for 13 more minutes. You have time. Um, you bring up an interesting point with respect to media coverage, um, and I think that so often it's not even just the behavior in kitchens that sort of perpetuates this, you know, um, held up machismo. It's things like marketing and pop cultural stereotypes around chefs. Um, Momi, I was wondering if, you know, you feel like messaging and like, you know, the image of what a chef is or the image of what a barista or, you know, a beer guy is, how much does that help or hurt women? Um, sorry. I, so in terms of how we see chefs or how we see um, stereotypes of people in specific industries, do you think that that hurts women as well? Um, I think it intimidates the women, I think. The women are, I think, much more shy here. Um, that's, I think that's how I see it in barista world. I don't know about the chef world, but um, a lot of girls wanted to become barista, wants to make coffee, but they feel like it's a, such a men culture and they don't want to be like, you know, coming to, you know, push around and, um, but I think um, it just the image is kind of like intimidating, but I think each one of women should be a little bit more like courageous and, you know, if they could do it, like we could do it, you know, like it's all equal. That's how I feel and that's how I have been doing. Um, if men could do it, then I could do it because it's human, like that, that's how I feel, so, yeah. <laughs> Um, one of the, the bi biggest culprits in perpetuating this idea of, you know, the my, my knife is bigger than your knife culture of chefs is um, Anthony Bourdain. And he wrote an article for Slate that came out last week where he was sort of contrite and ap apologetic about his role in perpetuating that stereotype. Um, Ivy, I wanted to talk to you about this. Uh, what do you make of that sort of late apology and how much responsibility do men in leadership bear for making the changes that are so necessary? Oh, I think that he was part of a system that had long been the way it is, and he's been out of it for a very long time. And he's like, you know, the cool version of Anderson Cooper now. So I don't hold him <laughs> responsible for bro culture. It, it, bro culture has existed for a very long time, and it will continue to exist as long as guys don't, the guys perpetuating it, aren't perceived as just guys have, it's, uh, when it's treated as something that's not cool, it's not okay to have a dinner with your buddies if, oh, if you're only a bunch of guys. When you work with women, you have women in your kitchens, you have women in your front of house, you know all the female chefs in this city. Tonight at the dinner party, all the female chefs that are cooking, I think there's 20 of them, there are 40 male chefs who are serving. They all know each other. And not just in Toronto, in every single city, you fucking know these chicks. So stop just getting your line of dicks together to headline. <laughs> tell the big festival or tell anyone, I'm not just pointing to big festival, every single thing that's only men in the lineup, say I'm not gonna do it unless you ask my buddy Renee and my buddy Susan and my buddy whoever because it's not just Bert and Maddie and fucking Scott. There's a lot of chicks, you know them by name, you know their food, you love their food. Just fucking include them, you idiots. <laughs> and Converted, so whatever. Yeah, Scott. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I think that that mindset goes for everything, right? Like whether whether it's whether it's change in the corporate world, whether it's we have a ton of associations in our industry um, that represent every kind of imaginable food that Ontario farmers and Canadian farmers are growing. 
Um, and, and most of them are led by men. You look at those boards, and I, we, we know that 80 to 99, 100% of those boards are made up of old, white, gray-haired guys. And so, you know, how does that change? It changed, those guys know women that are smart and capable and can kick ass. You gotta ask, and it doesn't change unless the guys are part of this. Because, I mean, we can, we can ask. I, I, heard an, I heard an awesome quote from a woman who, who, when she gets asked and she can't do it and says no, she has three women waiting that she can recommend or refer to ask so that there's another woman being asked. But we're only half the population. We can't do it. We can't just do it ourselves. So, mm -hmm. so whether it's changing the speaker lineup at a conference or changing the board makeup on our Fortune 500 companies, on our nonprofit and industry associations, in our government, um, ever, you've got to have women in the wings waiting to be asked. And, mm -hmm. and I think we have, to, uh, we have to encourage the men around us that it's okay to ask, and they need to... I think nine times out of ten, they don't realize that uh, women typically aren't going to volunteer. So, so you need to ask because uh, we're less likely to, you know, raise our hands. Mm -hmm. So, um, sort of on that note, are there ways in which you think women themselves are their own worst enemies when it comes to undermining their success in, in food or beverage or, you know, any any such industry? Oh, I don't even want to answer that question. We already have enough shit on our shoulders. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Anybody else? <laughs> I, I mean, I think the research shows it, right? That we, yeah, there's, mm -hmm. there's, I mean, lean in, right? It's all there. There's lots for us to, that we focus a lot on empowerment in the Ag Women's Network, but um, empowerment isn't going to move the dial and, and change the systemic problems in our society. So mm -hmm. we have to fight for a lot more mm -hmm. than just empowering each other. Crystal, did you want to weigh in on that one? I, well, I'm with Ivy. Like, the, we, we give ourselves enough crap. I mean, one thing I do is, like, I think I don't celebrate my own successes. The other day I was talking to a brewer who I covered his story, probably like my third column ever on beer, Six years ago, I went to his house and he was home brewing, and now he's opening his own brewery. And I was like, can you imagine, like, six years ago that you would have come this far? And I had a picture of myself then that I was exactly what I was then that I am now, that nothing, I've achieved nothing else. And he's like, well, I think of you as the same. Like, when you came to my apartment, you knew jack shit about beer. You were not, you had no designations. Like, you were like, oh, I think I want to learn more. Now you're like a certified Cicerone. You know, you're like one of the most well-educated women experts in the industry. You started this company with your sister. You do tastings. You write for the Globe. I'm like, oh, right. So I think that's, that's me, but I, I think a lot of us suffer from that. You're so busy thinking about what's coming next and what you're not doing that you don't stop to celebrate who you are and how far you've come and then ask for what you're worth because of it, right? Mm -hmm. Um, I wanted to throw this question out to the entire panel because it's, it's pretty far-reaching. Momi, maybe we can start with you and work this way. Um, obviously, these conversations are really important, but conversations can only do so much. So I wanted to ask you all, what are some practical, platitude-free ways to bring about equality in these industries? So what needs to change, and who can help us do that? Um, I guess women uh, has to speak up a bit because, um, uh, I don't know, and also, like, I, I was really lucky in the situation, like, all the places that I was worked for, um, everybody, oh, it, everybody was women, like, or women's owner. So, you know, like, those things right in front of me, it just, like, made me feel like it's very uh, comfortable and also, like, it's just, like, a learning process from them, like, directly. Um, they... They both had a uh, male owner as well, and they also treated us as equally, every, tre treated us everybody e equally. So I feel really, really lucky to be in that situation that I didn't have to um, experience those sexism. But um, I guess everybody has to be aware, and that would change like slowly. Like uh, I think that would change. So this would be like a great thing, like you know, having. Chatelaine having these events or like paneling, you know, focusing on this, uh, 
I think it, it really helps us in the future. Jen? Yeah, I think I, I agree. It starts with awareness. Um, half the time we don't even realize the own biases that we're perpetuating and the things, you know, the, the um, gendered stereotypes that we're either raising our kids with or, or our nieces in my case. Um, and I'm going to put her on the spot. We've got a great team from the Ag Women's Network here and several producers. And um, our, my friend and colleague Claire talks about spheres of in influence. So you got to get uncomfortable and it's and you start with what you can do and you know eventually we got to call out sexism we got to we got to ask for whether it's whether it's the the you know pay raise and ask for what we're worth and you know maybe you're not comfortable with doing all of that right now but you got to you know start with what you can do right now and just keep pushing um, because that's, we, we, we can't keep letting the things that we just put up with um, continue. Uh, we, have to, we have to start calling them out and getting, you know, the folks who have the power and influence around us to be willing to call those things out also. Crystal? Um, I think women should drink more beer. <laughs> Uh, I think a lot of problems would be solved if we all just drank more beer. Um, no, but seriously, like women used to be the brewers, right? So until industrial, the Industrial Revolution, we were making all the beer and we were making it all in our kitchen and we were doing it very well. And it wasn't until it became a profitable exercise that it was ripped from the hands of women. Uh, they were basically called witches. The old alewives wore pointy hats and they always had brooms to keep things clean and cats to keep their uh, boiling pots of beer uh, clear. So there's a big connection there and uh, I think it's something that we have forgotten about and the, the, the language around home brewing has been kind of co-opted by male hobbyists who are all engineers and they over-engineer home brewing and it's kind of not something you can easily do in your kitchen anymore, but actually it is. And so I would like to see a um, different narrative around making beer and for women to be as excited about making beer as they are about making pasta. So I think that could help. And Ivy, last but not least. Well, I think the number one thing that you can do if you're in the culinary industry, if you're working in restaurant kitchens or front of house, and you're dealing with any kind of sexism, my advice would be to quit or just walk out. Because right now, the restaurant industry across North America is experiencing a huge crisis of staff. Nobody's going into this industry because they are discovering that you make zero money, the, pay, the work actually is hard, and you don't waltz out as Jamie Oliver after a few weeks on the job. So <laughs> it's not glamorous, it's a really, it's hard work, it's grimy, it's shitty, it's, I'm out of it for many reasons. <laughs> but if you're in it, and you're putting up with any kind of crap, just stop and quit and walk out. I'll help you find another job, seriously. I, I can get you in another kitchen like that. Just don't put up with it, because if you've got a sexist chef or a sexist organization that's not treating you the way you're supposed to be treated, they can't run without you. If enough people walk out, they're done. Or they'll, they'll either fold or ch they'll change their ways. And we want people to change their ways, because we want lots of restaurants. So, yeah. That was actually right as the clock turned to zero, so that was perfectly choreographed. Um, we're going to open up to a few audience questions right now, including from the invisible hordes of the internet. So, if you're out there, feel free to ask some questions as well. so bad anyway so uh, <laughs> but honestly you guys are great role models thank you so much for being honest and real and uh, and leading the way for all these like uh, inspired women who are going to go on and change the world so thank you thank you hi 
Hi, I'm not going to stand up because I'm super tall and they may not be able to see me. Um, I work in investments and I'm here as a guest with my girlfriend, but we go through, and I love food as well, so it's great to be here. Um, we deal with this type of stuff almost on a daily basis and some of the things that we've been doing over the last little while to change the conversation um, is starting to talk about diversity of thought and how important that is in our industry. And so there's all kinds of stats and research that have recently been done about um, women CEOs, so companies with um, women on their boards or uh, as CEOs generate 30% more profit than those with all male CEOs or, or executives. And so I'm wondering if there's anyone advocating on your behalf uh, in this industry so that you can start to change the, the conversation. Take that one. Um, I'm not sure. I'm not exactly sure what you meant. Like, do you? Uh, right. Right now, if there is in the restaurant world, I don't know about it. And as a writer, it's sort of like you're like a solo practitioner. So I, I really don't know. I feel like there's more support like that in the tech world, but, uh, and, and Vanna White is in yarn, and she's doing great things in yarn, so I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think, I think in, in agriculture, this seems like it's been a big topic the last little while, and um, I, we see a lot, of, a lot of our companies trying to uh, advance more women, and the, the government's been a big proponent of trying to uh, encourage more women to become producers and to see more diversity. Um, so it's, I, think, I think there's lots of appetite for it. Uh, it comes down to what are you actually doing, though, is it just uh, you know checking a box that you you did this work and did it make a difference, and, or or is it actually you know there's there's a lot there's a lot that has to change and it's hard work and I think a big part of it is culture right like if you have a great culture people will stay with you and everyone's opinions are valued and culture is the hardest thing to build in business so any other questions. Hello. So obviously the change starts with intention, right? But I think men and women are confused about kind of what you just said, but it's not just like stop being dicks. It's what, like, they don't know what to do to start. Because a lot of them aren't dicks, right? A lot of them are great. So I, I think someone has to just figure out a playbook for them, because they like sports. We know that. Just kidding. It, like. <laughs> Not a playbook, but just they don't know where to start because it's so ingrained. So that's why it's so hard to overcome because no one knows where to begin. So intention is good, but what's the next step from good intentions? I think. So I think like, you just start from the top down. Kitchens are hierarchical, and if the head chef says, "I will not allow this kind of behavior in my kitchen," it doesn't happen. Because I remember working in a kitchen for a short time where the chef didn't allow swearing. I didn't last very long there. <laughs> but it was a kitchen where there was no swearing, and that was the rule. So you didn't do it. And these things are possible if they're just insisted upon. And then it becomes, like in one kitchen, we had a lot of gay people on the staff. So no one was called a fag in that kitchen. In every other kitchen we were, that word was used constantly. But in this kitchen, we had people who would be offended by that term, so it wasn't used. So it's just, if the head chef, if the owners demand it, it, it works. It trickles down. And the people who want to do the old, be old school and be dicks, they can just move on to like Hooters or wherever <laughs> and uh, find jobs <laughs> elsewhere. But I don't think they need a playbook. They're adults. They should know how this works. Like as I was telling you, like I had the uh, women leadership, and like you know they didn't treat anybody sexism. So you know, like that's how I learned, and I I don't do that to my staff now. And you know, so as my business partner, like because he had also nice mentor, and you know he doesn't treat women or men 
like in, you know, unequally. So I think it's a leadership is a very important part of it. If you don't happen to have the good fortune of having a woke head chef, um, what else would you put in this, you know, this theoretical playbook that we're designing now? Um, what else would go in there aside from just happening upon great, you know, forward-thinking leadership? How can that come from the ground up with people that are already in the kitchen? Or in, you know, the, the brewery, for example, or the farm? I don't know. I mean, I hate to put it on women that are in the industry because we have enough going on, but I think it is kind of our responsibility. Like when the Ontario Craft Brewers got their conference together this year, I said, look, I want to MC it. They always have the same dude MC it every year. I'm like, pick my sister and I will do it. They're like, okay. And then I sent them names of three women I thought should give the keynote, none of whom came in. Um, they, and it was almost all men. I think almost every panel was a, almost fully male. Um, and the keynote was male, but at least you could start asking, right? And like another one of my colleagues taught a, taught a class at the Brewing College, there's not a female faculty member. She's like, come on guys, like, give me a job. And they kind of looked at her blankly like they didn't know what to do with her. But I think when you start asking, um, at least you start planting the seed. And I know at least with us uh, females in, in beer, as soon as I go to an event, I, I always talk to all the female brewers, almost automatically. I grew up with three sisters, um, and I just tend to gravitate towards women, and I, we always refer each other business. Um, we definitely have that kind of like underground network going on, and I think there's a lot of strength there. Um, so, you know, working with other women in the industry, to, and, and I think just putting like bugs in people's ears, and, and even me mentioning afterwards, to the conference, like not just telling you guys, but to write to the conference a letter and say, look, we want more female panelists, and ask, you know, all of my friends in the beer industry to sign it. Like, and it's not just women that are signing it either. Um, because I think half of it is, sadly, and I don't know why we have to talk about this in 2017, consciousness raising. Mm -hmm. um, like, it's a very, craft beer is great. It's a great industry, and craft brewers do so much for their communities, but they're these tiny little micro businesses, and they're really busy, and I think they, they think they're well-meaning and everything's cool because they have some female sales reps on staff. But if we're not talking about what the problems are or the sexism that we face, then they don't know either. And it's not the same, it's not in the same public eye as it is in, in kitchens. And it's not nearly as violent or um, misogynistic, I think, in, in craft brewing as it is mm -hmm. uh, in food. So. Um, with what little time we have left, I, just, I was... I oh, yeah, go ahead. add sorry. to that and say what, one thing that you can do is... You can talk to each other and you can warn each other and you can talk back and say, don't treat me like this and you can do all that. But you can also just say, fuck it and go online and say what's happening and like let the cat out of the bag and call them out for it. Because that stuff doesn't go away. If you speak the name and say what's happening to you, you have every right to do that. And that stuff doesn't go away and people read it and people hear it and people take it in and you force change that way. Given that we've been talking a lot about, you know, the power of a recommendation, so, you know, if you can't go to a conference, you recommend three other women that can in your place. I was wondering if we take sort of the last 30 seconds and pay it forward, and if each of you could recommend a woman who is doing great things in your industry, who doesn't have, you know, such a high profile, say as Jen Egg, who's doing wonderful things, but, you know, there are so many young women and so many women, you know, um, who are minorities or sexual minorities um, who don't get the credit that they necessarily deserve. So I'm wondering if maybe you could give little kudos if you have Sure. Them. I would say if you read anyone in food writing, you should be reading Deb Reed because she has taken this up and she is fighting for women chefs and women in this industry and fighting for equality. And everything she writes is so smart and so brilliant. And she's got a piece in the Globe and Mail this weekend that's wonderful. So... Deborah Reed. Uh, well, I've already given my shout out to the Society of Beer Drinking Ladies. You should all go to one of their bevies. It's one of the most fun places for women to drink beer. It's uh, female only, uh, really great monthly events. And also uh, to go to Mascot because uh, Siobhan McPherson is the uh, head brewer there and I think she's the most talented uh, brewer in Ontario and she's making some fantastic beers um, and I think she's a little bit overlooked. So go drink a beer.
Well, it, it's hard to call out one farmer. There's a lot of farmers online that if you want, to, if you have questions about your food and how it's grown, ask a farmer. And if you search on social media, you're going to find a lot of them. There's a few here today that uh, you can speak to. And I'm going to uh, call out Amanda Broadhagen if you want to know about how your beef is raised. She's your girl. And uh, Sandy Brock is also uh, raising sheep. And she's very active on social media. And she'll give you the real deal on, on how it's, how, how, sh how it is being a sheep farmer. So she, that, that's just two, but there is, there, there is hundreds of farmers on social media, great women telling their story. So you can find them. Well, as I mentioned it earlier, um, Diana is uh, the course um, espresso bar owner, and she has a lot experience than I am. And she's one of my mentor as well, uh, Nadej uh, Narian, which is the uh, owner of Nadej Petisseri. She's a great entrepreneur. Um, they both are very successful, and it's uh, a lot to uh, share with you guys. So please do come up to them and talk to them. All right, well, uh, that's all the time we have, ladies. I want to say thank you so much for coming and sharing your stories, being so candid and so roundly kick-ass. I know um, I'm inspired. I'm sure a lot of you are, too. Um, I think that's it. Rachel, do you want to take it back? <laughs>